All right, let's talk about image grammar. This is the introduction to image grammar. Um, some of the basic concepts here are definitely going to be something that you're going to see tie into the test. So pay close attention. All right, let's talk a little bit about why you'd want to use image grammar. And um, let's start with an example. This is taken from Michael Crichton's The Jurassic Park. Notice that um, this example has quite a few areas where you're adding action. And the whole idea with image grammar is uh, to focus on pumping up your sentences, making them more visual, more active, have it move. That way your reader is, is literally on the edge of his seat, racing to the end of what he's reading. And if you notice that this first paragraph here actually is one long sentence. A and um, if they weren't using image grammar, the piece would be quite a bit longer. So let's look at how Michael Crichton creates his images. Nedry opened the car door, glancing back at the dinosaur to make sure it wasn't going to attack, and felt a sudden excruciating pain in his eyes, stabbing like spikes into the back of his skull. And he squeezed his eyes shut and gasped with the intensity of it, and threw up his hands to cover his eyes, and felt the slippery foam trickling down both sides of his nose. Spit. The dinosaur had spit in his eyes. So let's think about this. First of all, it's all one sentence. Second of all, how does he connect all the action in the sentence? He connects the action through the use of punctuation, commas, there's that comma there, and there, and elsewhere, I can't see. And then of course, the conjunctions, and, 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 and. So everything connects together. Now you'll notice that certain parts of this passage are underlined, and that was done intentionally, because the underlined parts add what are called brush strokes, and we're going to focus on the, those in later lessons. The brush strokes basically are special ways to pump up your writing. So think about this. What did Nedry do? Okay. He opened the car door. What else did he do? He, squ he squeezed his eyes shut, right? Okay. So basically, your subject is Nedry, and your verb is opened. And then, since this is a, um, a sentence that continues on, we have subject and verb. Okay. What else did he do? He gasped, there's your verb, okay, and threw up his hands and felt the slippery foam trickling down both sides of his nose. Okay, so base <coughs> excuse me. Basically he has um, multiple verbs in this sentence. It's a compound sentence. He's um, uh, and the, he continues on in this sentence. But in addition to the verbs, Crichton is adding some describers. Okay, so let's look at this. What did he feel? He felt the slippery foam. Well, what kind of foam? The foam that is trickling down both sides of his nose. So now it's not just foam, it's foam that's trickling. So we've got movement there, and he's creating a very vivid image. And then, of course, let's go back a little bit. All right, he's got pain in his eyes. Well, what kind of pain? Well, it's a stabbing pain. So again, we're modifying pain, but we're not just modifying with the old school, well, it was a lot of pain, or it was a big pain. No, we're using stabbing, which again, is very visual and very intense. 
And when he opened the car door, what was he doing? He was glancing back. A and in reality, that is actually describing Nedry. By the way, who names our kid Nedry? Really? Anyways, uh, so we see um, multiple examples of, again, what are called brush strokes. And we'll talk about the specifics later. Incidentally, these are called participles. And a participle is a word, a verb, that you turn into an adjective. You add an ing, and you utilize it as an adjective in the sentence. Let's look at the next paragraph. Even as he realized that the pain overwhelmed him, and he dropped to his knees, disoriented, wheezing. Now notice the commas here. The comma offsets the describer. Disoriented, wheezing. Again, these guys, disoriented and wheezing, are two describers. And, and what are they describing? They are describing good old Nedry, way over here in the sentence. And if you know your parts of speech, you know that any word that describes or modifies a noun is called an adjective. Well, these aren't your typical adjectives because originally they were verbs, but they're used as adjectives, and in, in essence, they've become what's called a participle. You're going to see a lot more examples of present participles. Those are the ones with ing, but you need to be aware that they're also ones with ed, and those are called past participle, participles. Well, what else does he do? He um, collapsed on his side, and notice this last part of the sentence really adds the visual. His cheek pressed to this, the wet ground, his breath coming in thin whistles through the constant ever screaming pain that caused flashing spots of light to appear behind his tightly shut eyelids. So we do all of this in one uh, or in two paragraphs. We have all this description, all these ideas. If you actually watch the video clip, you'll notice that um, it takes them probably about 10 minutes to play the clip and, and do all this, and, and it still doesn't do the same justice that these two paragraphs do. So quite obviously, um, writers that use image grammar are definitely more descriptive, more vivid, they add more action, and so the bottom line is the reason for image grammar is to add more um, excitement, more imagery to the writing. So let's, let's go on from there. Obviously, we're painting with words. We're trying to make our writing better. And that's the bottom line. Let's make that writing better. So obviously, we're talking about, first of all, looking at good writing, like we just did, and what makes that writing effective. And then as we look at that, we're going to try to imitate some of those techniques to make our own writing better. Ultimately, in looking at writing, as we start to notice when people use the image grammar, we're going to be able to evaluate. Is that good or bad? Does it work? Or are they just trying to stick words in there that don't exactly flow, don't exactly work? And, and, and we'll figure that out. We'll also look at our own writing and say, you know, is this working? Am I applying this technique correctly or can I do a better job? And of course, we're, our main goal is to become a thinker, a critical reader of writing as well as a, a critical writer, if you will. A and that's not the type of critical where you're, you know, putting someone down. It's the kind of critical where you're thinking, deeply thinking about the material that you're reading and writing. All this applies to style, and style is who you are. But it's not just, um, you know, how you dress. It's how you write. And the words you use, the voice, those all play into the style. It's also how you put those words together, and that's going to tie a lot into the image grammar. And of course, great writers always show more than they tell. We want to feel it. We want to see it in our own mind's eye as opposed to be told that that's what it is. So let's look at an example of showing more than telling. The amateur is just going to tell you, Bill was nervous. And you have to take his word for it. But the professional is going to say,
Bill sat in the dentist's waiting room, peeling the skin at the edge of his thumb until the raw red flesh began to show. Biting the torn cuticle, he ripped it away and sucked at the warm sweetness of his own blood. Okay, so your original or your initial reaction to this piece is ew. And it should be. Because that's what the author is intending. And that ew reaction, or rather the mood, remember that's the feeling that the re reader feels, that mood created indicates the purpose and the purpose for the writer here is to indicate that Bill was nervous. So let's look at another one. Mary was tired. Well, what do, what do you do when you're tired? What are your physiological reactions? You might stumble, you're going to yawn, what else? Blink quite a bit, your head might droop. So let's see what the writer, a professional writer or an effective writer might do. Mary shuffled into the kitchen yawning, blinking. Collapsing to a chair, she closed her eyes, crossed her arms for a pillow, and slowly tucked her head onto the fold. So let's look at this. The writer uh, uses a great verb here, shuffled. Okay, didn't They didn't put Mary walked into the kitchen. They put shuffled, which is very descriptive. Also notice the writer uses yawning and blinking which are ing words that are used as adjectives and we know when we use an ing verb as an adjective obviously describing Mary Mary it's called a participle let's look at another participle collapsing into a chair, and again that's describing she, or rather Mary. She closed her eyes, crossed her arms for a pillow, and slowly tucked her head onto the fold. Okay. By the way, um, when you're creating a participle, uh, participles are again often s offset by a comma. They act as an adjective, but they're not where a verb would normally be in a sentence. So if I put uh, something like Mary uh, was shuffling, excuse the poor handwriting, was shuffling is the verb. That's what Mary was doing. Always think about the sentence in this fashion. Okay, the subject is a who or what, Mary. What Mary does is always the verb. So if you ask yourself the question, who or what, blank, blanked, well, there's, there's your subject. If you take the subject and say, okay, Mary, what did Mary do? Okay, well, the answer to that is going to be your verb. Assuming we're using a, an active tense, a, a sentence that involves action. Okay, so once you've figured out that, then everything else is going to be some sort of describer or, or, or something else additional. So if, like we have here, yawning and blinking is after that verb or even in front of the subject, it's got to be, it's got to be a participle. Okay, so let's review. First of all, when you're looking at writing that uses image grammar, you need to ask yourself a few questions. 
why? And that's always the question you should ask when you're reading something, is why did the writer use this? What was his or her purpose? How does this piece affect, or rather the image grammar affect the overall piece? And a lot of times it's going to make it, more, it the answer to that is going to be that it emphasized something, it made, it made the action more intense, it helped the reader create a better image, uh, it was more descriptive. Those are usually your common answers. And ultimately that's what we're going to be looking at is how does uh, all of this relate to the piece that we're reading? How can we identify that? And by giving you image grammar, I'm giving you the verbiage, the vocabulary, to be able to describe the piece. In class, I gave a piece that, that used, one piece that used image grammar and the identical piece describing the identical situation not using image grammar. And one, the, the one that didn't use image grammar was much, much shorter, but it was also much less descriptive. And as I asked the class, okay, tell me what, what's better about the longer one. It was hard for people to put it into words. They liked it. They, they said the longer one was more descriptive. They could picture it better in their heads. But they lacked some of the verbiage that we're going to learn as we go through the image grammar unit. All right, so the next piece is going to be the specifics. We're going to focus a little bit more on participles. And then we'll talk about how participles tie in to absolutes, which are, are kind of like a close cousin to um, participles.